Hello, and welcome to another Midweek Reflection. And this week, you join me in the salubrious surroundings of Castle Square, where I'm, uh, uh, the, the church hall here, where I'm having a, a quick break after conducting a funeral this afternoon. And uh, when I uh, conduct funerals, as I, as I have done uh, a fair few over the last few months, you know, one of the things I try and think about is how, how we can, in a unique way to each person, honour the person we're remembering um, in the service and how we can offer thanks for their life, um, for the love of God that we might have seen with, within their life, for the hope of life to come. Um, and that's what a lot of us will be doing at 11 o'clock today, to remember with thanks, to remember with hope, to remember uh, with our vow to do our best to bring peace into our relationships in communities and across the world. And we do that in many different ways, of course. We do that with the silence. We do that with our reflections that are last Sunday. Uh, we do that with um, some iconic music. But we also do it with the um, visible signs of remembrance, the, the poppies, be they white or red, or the white peace poppy, the red traditional one, uh, the yellow Welsh one, or the purple one, to remember animals um, uh, that have been injured or killed in war. And sometimes having a visible, tangible symbol of remembrance helps us uh, to remember something, to mark something. Jesus knew this all, all too well. Um, it's why you know, on the night before he died, when he was at the mill with his friends, you know, he took tangible, visible, physical things and said, this will help you remember me. You know, here is the bit bread broken. Here is the wine poured. When you eat this, when you drink this, when you share these things, remember me, remember my life, remember my love for you, for others, remember my teachings. Um, and certainly today, we, we also remember his death and rising too. So sometimes those physical, visible things are deliberate markers to help us remember. And at other times, um, we remember almost subconsciously, uh, involuntarily. And uh, Marcel Proust, the great French uh, novelist and uh, essayist, uh, wrote about this in, in various um, volumes of his work, uh, all of his work, of course, I have read uh, the titles of. Um, but in A la recherche du temps perdu, uh, In Search of Lost Time, he, he talks about involuntary memories, essentially, how you could be doing something innocuous and that action, that taste, that smell, that sound takes you back to a certain place. And his example he gives are with uh, Madeleine cakes. Mm. Shouldn't talk with my mouthful. And he says of um, when when you dip uh, the the madeleine cake into a, a cup of tea, how that uh, immediately takes him back to to childhood. Um, how that immediately evokes the feeling of being a child, where he was, what he was doing. And I can totally understand that. Um, for me, it's, it's um, the taste of Tixilix, the childhood med medicine Tixilix, takes me back to about being six and having a, a slight telling off for drinking the whole bottle of the medicine because I liked the taste of it. Or the smell of bacon frying, even for this pescatarian, takes me to my nan and granddad's house and knowing that dinner was on the way. Or even the song Agadoo uh, takes me to Warner's Holiday Camp on the Isle of Wight uh, where we used to go as a family uh, every year from when I was born, well, even before I was born, um, when I was, uh, uh, let's not go there, uh, until I was, when I was 16. Um, so those smells and tastes and sounds take me back to those places. And I think it's, it's true of, of many of us. We even see, you know, in incredibly moving examples, individuals that might be suffering from dementia, who, who may seem, um, hard to, to communicate with, we, we might be unsure if they're understanding, listening, what, what's, what's going on, but sometimes just a piece of music that takes them back um, many years, sometimes that they, they join in with that. So that memory is lodged in there and uh, that sound kind of evokes uh, a time gone by. So that's the challenge for this week, to think about what taste takes you back to your childhood or smell or um, music. Um, what's, what's your involuntary um, memory mechanism? So it could be um, a meal that when you have, you know, you can remember 
uh, eating it as a child. It could be a song that takes you back that your mother sung to you or, or, or that you sang at school. It could be um, a smell, a particular smell of a perfume that maybe a nan or an older relative had that immediately takes you back. Have a think about what takes you back. Those um, smells, tastes, sounds, touch that take you back to your childhood. Um, share them if you would like um, uh, on the, in the usual places, WhatsApp, Facebook, email. Um, and if we do have any um, to share, we'll, we'll, we'll do those next week. Um, so that's this week's. Last week, uh, because um, this week now is Interfaith Week, uh, and there are a few events that are on in our newsletter. So have a look at that on the website if you're interested. Uh, I asked us to think about what have we learned from people of different worldviews? What have we learned from people of different faiths or, or from different religions or traditions? Uh, but I'm hoping we're going to see some of those at the end of this. Um, but perhaps not. Perhaps people have um, just thought about it. Um, the things that we've learned, the things that we value in other religions or faiths or worldviews. Because I think when we, when we stop and we respect those um, who might be other to us, um, then that's the, uh, the first step in learning how to love, uh, to listen, to love, to appreciate, to respect, to know that every single human being has dignity and worth as a beloved child of God. If we all uh, embrace that more, perhaps, um, perhaps there would be no uh, future need to, to remember the horrors perhaps, but perhaps no more conflict and war would come about. But I think I'm beginning to, to waffle now um, and say, fall into cliches. So for now, I will bid you uh, farewell, um, have a good week, go well, and I shall um, see you anon. Take care. So no PowerPoint today, but we do have a few thoughts from a couple of individuals who have shared what they've learned from people of other faiths and uh, different worldviews. Ray says um, about the Jewish people, uh, the way they constantly argue without rancor, both with each other and with God. The very name Israel means one who strives with God. It says something very profound about the nature of God and of faith. About uh, those of the uh, Islamic faith, the way they share their prayers wherever they are and express their faith in a completely unabashed way at all times. From Buddhists, he's learned the lesson of calm meditation, acceptance and finding the God within. From Hindus, their acceptance and variety of non-dogmatic devotion. From Sikhs, I didn't read this bit before, I totally agree with Phil here. Thanks Ray, I know I'm in a good position when I hear that. Uh, in the Christian churches, running a free lunch for homeless people or, e or even a church tea always seems a big deal but a Sikh Gurdwara has an ever-open kitchen with a free meal ready for all. Is it a coincidence that uh, the, uh, the the single men really appreciate the, uh, the free lunches that places put on? Maybe, I don't know. That's uh, possibly a terribly sexist comment. Christians, um, uh, we are so biased that perhaps it's better to say that we don't, what we don't like about Christians. That's a, a good question. The main thing for me is the way we label each other as orthodox or heretical. Justification by faith is a great principle when understood in the right way, but it tends to be, uh, it tends to become justification by doctrine. But I would completely agree with Ray there too. And from Michael, I would like to give thanks for Rabbi Jonathan Sachs for all his work in seeking reconciliation and unity. Um, and, and that's particularly apposite uh, as he was put to rest, um, later rest uh, last week. And I have to say, I'm a big fan of, of, this book of his, Not In God's Name, one of the best books about um, religious violence and um, our way to reconciliation that, we, uh, that might be good for Interfaith Week. So I recommend that. Um, and Michael also said, I've always been impressed by the wisdom and understanding of the First Nation Americans. This from Chief Seattle in 1856 in a letter to the then president. The great white chief in Washington sends word he wishes to buy our land. This is strange to us as the earth does not belong to man but man belongs to the earth. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand within it. What he does to the strand, he does to himself. And I think uh, those words uh, given at, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, hopefully after the news this week, uh, with hope in sight for the end, 
but uh, the interrelated nature of all of creation, I think that's something uh, that people of all faiths and none might um, accept and might need to uh, live out a bit more. Oh, oh, I'm quite low. <laughs> oh dear, never mind. Uh, I've not got time to re-record this. I've got things to do. So have a wonderful week and uh, I'll get on with them. Bye.